Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Brigadier General Jeffrey J. Johnson, the Commanding General of Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. Brook Army Medical Center serves as the largest and most robust military healthcare organization within the Department of Defense. Both inpatient and outpatient services are provided by approximately 8,500 staff members, including active duty military personnel from each of the uniformed services, federal civilian employees, and contractors. Brook is a level one trauma center and includes a 40 bed burn center. It is also a hub for graduate medical education with more than 30 graduate medical education programs. General Johnson is a board certified family medicine physician and has served in and commanded a wide range of units from traditional clinics and hospitals to special forces units and the legendary 82nd Airborne and is deployed in support of the Army's missions around the world. I have produced two versions of this podcast, an extended version that includes our complete conversation and an edited version. You are listening to the extended version. If you'd like to listen to the edited version, please see our website. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you might be accessing this recording. Thanks for listening. And here is Brigadier General Jeffrey J. Johnson. Welcome to the Forge, General Johnson. Uh, It's great to have an opportunity to talk with you. So you went to Evangel College in Springfield, Missouri, where you earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. What drew you to Evangel, and why biology? Yeah, The uh, decision of where to go to college growing up in northwest Montana was uh, actually not easy. I, I knew at that time that I wanted to go into medicine. Montana doesn't have a medical school of its own. So I had to figure out where do I want to go to school. Through a variety of different events that took place, I I landed on Evangel University, which is affiliated with the church that I go to. It's a small Christian liberal arts college uh, in uh, in Missouri, and it really gave me an opportunity to have a very personalized beginning of my uh, post-high school education. Biology, uh, I saw that as the means by which uh, I was going to be best equipped to be able to get into medical school. It it probably wasn't any more complicated than that for uh, why biology. So when did you know you wanted to go into medicine? So you knew that going straight into college. What what drew you to the profession? Yeah, I I had a, a very strong sense of calling when I was in high school. The sciences, math, were clearly where I was uh, I, f- I felt that was my sweet spot, and so that was uh, that was pretty natural. But really, felt like I was called to serve others who were in need, and specifically in need of health-related issues. And then uh, I really loved the concept, uh, at least that I had uh, in high school, thinking about medicine, that it really was a profession where you're given a problem and a bunch of information, and then you have to kind of sort through all of that to figure out what's the right course moving forward, and then how is it that you help somebody along that course. And and that was really appealing to me. And you also did ROTC while you were in college. When did you become involved with ROTC? Yeah, I started in ROTC halfway through my first year. It became pretty evident to me uh, that if I was going to continue to be enrolled in uh, at Evangel University, I was going to have to find a way to pay for it, or my parents were going to have to take out a, a mortgage on their house. So while I clearly had a strong patriotic sense and a feel, a drive, I also, frankly, just needed a way to be able to pay for school. And so at that point, uh, when I came back from my second year, I received a scholarship at that point in order to really be able to get me through school. At that time, I believed that was just going to be a mechanism by which I would pay for school, get 
the training for the profession that I wanted to be, and then uh, exit out of the military maybe four years later. So you so you, at that point when you first started, it wasn't you weren't thinking the military was going to be a, a career. No, not at all. So after graduating from Evangel, you went to medical school at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center in Denver, Colorado. Why UC Denver? Yeah, the Health Sciences Center in uh, Denver was probably pretty natural for me. Uh, growing up in Montana, I really wanted to be somewhere out west. And so looking at where were medical schools that would look at out-of-state individuals uh, in order to come in. So that's some of how I got to Colorado being on the short list. But the reputation that the University of Colorado had certainly drove me to them, especially when it came to internal medicine and primary care, uh, which is really what I felt like I wanted to do uh, in order to best serve, serve people. What surprised you about medical school? So it was something that you kind of envisioned from the time you were in high school. So then you got there. Was there anything that kind of surprised you about it? Uh, maybe it wasn't quite, not, not in a negative way, but just kind of um, uh, you didn't have a complete clear expectation. I think there's a couple of different things that surprised me. I think the first was just the amount of time at least for me, that it took in order to completely engage in the curriculum, that I really needed to focus almost my, uh, you know, 100% of my effort in order to be able to study and try to master the the knowledge that was there. And so I I was a little bit surprised by the the number of things that I needed to put on the back burner, hobbies, uh, other interests in life, and say, okay, for this period of time, I'm going to need to put those away and uh, really concentrate here. I I don't know that I was quite ready uh, for that experience. I think the other piece that I started recognizing uh, in medical school was this concept of stereotypes, of different specialists having a stereotypic personality style and approach to life that I began to be able to start to pick up so that when I was doing a uh, ophthalmology rotation or a general surgery rotation or a internal medicine rotation, this concept of, okay, do I, do I really recognize and identify with that mindset and that lifestyle uh, that goes along with it? I didn't realize that that would be that strong. I thought that uh, all personalities would equally distribute themselves into all of the different specialties in medicine, but uh, that that became a little bit different for me uh, in in medical school. So was that part of what drew you or confirmed your interest in primary care? Yeah, absolutely. When when I looked at how how do I best situate myself to be able to take care of as many people as possible and to really be that coordinator of health for individuals who are trying to move along life's pathways, family medicine really identified to me as the place where you can do that best, that you didn't have to just say, okay, I know that uh, you came here today for this problem. We've addressed that problem, but really I can see there's these four other problems, but I'm, I can't do anything about those. You have to go see somebody else. When I was when I rotated through the different specialists and was presented with that way of thinking, it was like, whoa, that, that it's just kind of disingenuous a little bit from my perspective that I couldn't take care of them from a from a whole patient perspective. So, a quick question: So, you graduated, you had had a scholarship to your undergraduate, you went on to medical school. Did the military pay for your medical school as well? I did not. Okay. Uh, I was able to figure out how to get the right loans at the right time in order to pay for that. Uh, at that point, my thinking was I really wanted to preserve uh, options that if this military thing really wasn't what I wanted to do, that at the end of the four-year commitment that I had for ROTC, that I would have the ability to make that, that choice as opposed to locking myself in uh, at that point, uh, it really would have been for the four years from ROTC, the three years from residency, 
Uh, and so I really wouldn't be able to come to a decision point for at least another seven years after I completed medical school. Yeah. So you completed medical school and you went on active duty with the Army. And it looks like you went straight to a residency and family practice at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. Is that correct? That is true. Okay. So um, so tell us, what is family practice for folks who are not familiar with this particular specialty? I think the, the, the modern name, at least uh, certainly that the academy would represent, would be family medicine. Okay. Uh, the, the term practice sometimes has a, a little bit of a hard definition piece to get across to the public, but uh, family medicine is, is really how we like to describe ourselves. To me, this is the specialty that concentrates on putting the patient in the center and really concentrates on you as a patient. It's then designed to coordinate all of the aspects of health that start preconception and then move all the way through life to the end of life decisions that are being made. The other piece that I think is inherent inside of family medicine is that it is a relationships focused specialty where we firmly believe that through the power of creating those personal relationships with our patients, that we're then able to leverage that for health outcomes. The, okay. the other piece is that it, it is clearly a specialty that wants to be as inclusive in everything that it does from OBGYN care to pediatrics to geriatrics to sports medicine, procedures, inpatient, outpatient kinds of care. And that that's that's really what I observed the specialty to be that was really intriguing to me. And, and how all of those different pieces are interrelated with each other, that it's not just one disease or one diagnosis, and you can just concentrate on that. You don't have to worry, worry about any of the other pieces. They're all interrelated, and you're, you're better off if you can address them all as opposed to just one at a time. How do you compare uh, or how do you differentiate, say, family medicine from internal medicine, for example? Yeah, I think, I think the family medicine piece is really um, including all of the aspects of, of somebody's life. So I think the perspective of preventive medicine, I think the perspectives of OBGYN care, pediatrics, sports medicine, those are the pieces that are added on to family medicine that are a little bit different than just internal medicine. And, and so I think that's, that's some of the parts that differentiate uh, family medicine. Okay. And why, what drew you to Madigan? So the Army has a number of different uh, family medicine uh, residency sites. What was, what, did you have a choice? Or, and, and if so, what was, what was it about Madigan that, that attracted you? Yeah, I did have a choice. Uh, there were 10 different locations that I could have done family medicine training at. Once again, I thought the reputation at uh, Madigan being in Tacoma, Washington was spot on for how I looked at family medicine. It also was the closest place to uh, my hometown in northwest Montana. Mm. But I also, as I rotated there, really connected with the staff and felt the the climate of the residents uh, that were there ahead of me was really conducive to how I wanted to uh, learn and understand the specialty that I had chosen uh, to pursue. The other piece I think that drew me to uh, to Madigan was as a as a major medical center, the breadth and the opportunity of the different types of patients that were being seen there was greater than some of the other locations that I could have trained at. Okay. So one of the things I like to ask physicians when I talk with them is, is about the physician identity. And so being a doctor is an important part of someone's identity once they've gone through that process. One of the things I like to ask is, when did you feel like you really took on that identity? When did you say to yourself, you know, when you looked in the mirror, yep, I'm a, I am a physician, I'm a doctor? Yeah, was it was it right after when you graduated from medical school, or when did you feel like you took it on? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a good question. I, 
walking through the line at the University of Colorado, getting your degree, uh, and symbolically, we had our stethoscopes around our neck for that um, that graduation piece. So you so you knew that you were a physician at that point, but I don't think I really internally uh, understood that. I think when that when that became internal to me that I was a physician was probably about the first month, month and a half that I was an intern, middle of the night being on call, getting a phone call from the nurses saying, uh, Dr. Johnson, we need you to come to the floor. We've got a patient who uh, is not doing well. We're not sure what to do, and we need you to help us figure this out. So, you know, you're sitting there, you, you just woke up from whatever kind of sleep you were having. Right. And that walk from the call room to the ward at that point really uh, demonstrated to me that I now was an important part of this team. I was relied upon to be able to bring some decision making, some expertise to the table. And that that expertise was likely only to be able to come from somebody like me as a physician. And so I, I think that's really where that uh, that struck home for me uh, is after moving out of that encounter, it was, holy cow, uh, this <laughs> is uh, for real now. Right. So you graduated from your uh, residency program in 90, 1994, and it looks like the Army sent you directly to be the commander of Wiesbaden Health Clinic in Wiesbaden, Germany. Can you tell us a little bit about the clinic? Maybe how big was it? How many providers? How many staff? Yeah, I was really fortunate to be able to get that job coming straight out of residency. And to me, this was a part of what I thought was going to be kind of fun being in the military is to be able to go around the world. So going to Wiesbaden, Germany was uh, was really a great experience to see and, and get exposed to the culture that was there. The clinic, though, to me was a little bit overwhelming at first. There were about a 100 staff members, so medical technicians, administrative staff, and physicians. There were 12 primary care physicians. It was a primary care only clinic, so 12 physicians that were on staff there. And so walking in as a new graduate, there were two other new graduates that just came to the clinic that I felt very much were my peers. But then there were the the other nine who were very much senior to me, both by rank and mostly by experience. And so that was uh, that was kind of an interesting dynamic to walk into and say, hey, guess what? You're now the leader. Here's, here's your staff. I know you don't have any experience at leading uh, at this point, but you've got the, you've got the call. The other piece that was kind of interesting about that clinic at that time is, the year before, the military had downsized and closed a major medical center in Frankfurt. Uh, so that's the medical center that we all got accustomed to, patients coming back to after, uh, uh, like the Iran uh, hostages uh, came mm -hmm. back to that Frankfurt hospital. So the, the whole community was really a little bit turbulent at the time because they felt like uh, all of their medical care had uh, left them. And so the 100-member staff uh, really now was left to figure out how are you going to care for all of the people that are still in the community. That sounds like a complicated first job. Uh, so not only complicated from learning, uh, you know, now having a chance to really learn uh, learn my uh, craft as a, as a physician, not only complicated of trying to figure out, okay, how do you lead all these different kinds of health professionals, but really exposed very early to the, the political dynamics and the cultural dynamics of what health, uh, health delivery is uh, for a community. So what lessons did you take from that experience? Well, I think one of the biggest ones that I took away is, even as a captain, that I'm, as the commander, I was responsible for everything that the unit does, whether it was something that was good or something that was bad, I had the responsibility for that. Uh, and so to really try to figure out how do I operationalize uh, giving credit when things are going well to uh, everybody in the clinic, and then how do, you, 
how do you, on the back end, in private, take care of the issues of uh, discipline or misconduct or poor decision making. So that was, uh, I think that was part of the leadership piece that I gained from from that experience. Did you have someone to lean on? Was there a was there an, a, a a unit above you that you could kind of call on and a leader, maybe a leader you could call on and, and get some mentorship on how do I do all this stuff? Yes, uh, the Wiesbaden Health Clinic fell under Longstool Regional Medical Center, which is still there today, and I think most people would recognize that. Mm -hmm. There was a chief of primary care and outlying clinics. Uh, this was a lieutenant colonel who was a family physician as well, and uh, his willingness to listen and then to provide advice was absolutely instrumental for me, as well as his willingness to say, okay, Captain, understand that problem. You're probably not going to be able to take that issue on your own. Let me help you with that. Let me take it up to the commanding officer here or whatever that might be. So really knowing and giving me indicators of, hey, this is this is an issue you need to handle on your own, or this is uh, an issue that I need to help you with and to facilitate getting to uh, to an answer. So you were the clinic commander for about three years, and in 1997 you returned stateside to be the battalion and group surgeon for the 7th Special Forces Group at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. What is the 7th Special Forces Group, and what does it mean to be a battalion or group surgeon? Yeah, 7th Special Forces Group is one of the special operations units that is geographically assigned to different parts of the world to conduct the, uh, the, the military operations that they do. And that ranges everything from what we would all call combat all the way to training and developing host nation capabilities. And there's a big spectrum that goes from those two ends. So that's, that's really what they were charged with doing. And at that point in the late 1990s, 7th Special Forces Group was geographically aligned with Central and South America, and it was all about the drug war. How do we, how do we, how is our country active in decreasing the flow of, uh, of drugs, and how do we build up the infrastructure of those countries that wanted to do something about the drug trafficking that was taking place? So a battalion uh, surgeon, which is uh, where I started for a few months and then went to the group, really is just the breakdown of the size of the units. A battalion is typically about five to 700 people in it. A group would typically have about 1,500 people. My job as the surgeon was to specifically focus on the needs of of those service members assigned to that unit, in this case, Seven Special Forces, and to coordinate all of the health service support requirements, both for them in training in the United States, but then also how do we set up health service support for wherever they would go in Central and South America to execute their duties. So you had to ask questions like, I mean, they're not doing ordinary uh when they travel there, they're not doing just ordinary things. You have to think through how to make sure that they get the necessary medical support for all these different unusual kinds of assignments that they do. Correct. And I think the other piece that goes along with that is they typically go in very small numbers, maybe 10 to 15, and they're dispersed over a lot of different countries. There's about 32 countries that fall, fell into that, in that area of responsibility. So I really had to, had to figure out how do I project medical support to very small units, typically in austere environments where you may not be able to evacuate them very quickly. And how do you set up the conditions by which they have immediate medical support? And then how do you do transport? And how do you, how do you coordinate for their care? in host nation hospitals or getting them back to the US for definitive care. What do you what do you feel like your your biggest lessons learned from that assignment were? I think I would sum that up maybe in a couple of phrases. One would be you have to be ready anytime. 
because you never knew when it was that these special operators were going to get into something that you needed to be able to respond to. So ready anytime. And then expect the worst, plan for the worst, and hope for the best. So redundancy in planning, uh, having the backup plans to the, to the main plan was something that uh, I really had to concentrate hard on of, you know, plan A is, is not good enough. Uh, the special operators wanted to know, okay, so if that doesn't work, what's plan B and, and plan C? How, much, how many opportunities did you get to actually be on the ground in those countries? I spent a fair amount of time uh, in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, Honduras, Puerto Rico. So out of the two, roughly two years that I was there, I was probably off and on deployed into those countries, maybe for about uh, four months or so. How did your experiences in those countries affect the way you think about healthcare and the delivery of healthcare? Well, I really had a chance to be able to see how other countries' health professionals many times were very well trained and uh, very much understood pathophysiology, pharmacology, whatever it might be, but they didn't have the kit or they didn't have the stuff uh, to the same extent that we did, and that really hampered them from being able to provide the same standard of care that we would have here in the U.S. So it wasn't about one was more capable of understanding the knowledge. It really was the infrastructure of being able to execute that what, that made up a big difference. So you were with the 7th uh, until 2000 when you transitioned to be the director of resident training for family medicine at Womack Army Medical Center at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Tell us a little bit about this position. What was that? Yeah, so uh, originally the, for the first uh, year, I was the assistant director of the training program, but essentially this was a full academic position. We had a total of about 30 residents each year, family medicine residents, and the job really was how do you convey this specialty, the specialty of family medicine, to these uh, brand new officers and people who had just come out of medical school. And so it was taking them from day one of how do you get comfortable wearing a uniform, day one of how do you get comfortable uh, interfacing with nurses on the ward, all the way through their three-year journey to then feel very confident uh, at graduation that when you shook their hand and gave them the diploma, they were ready to go out and uh, function in every kind of setting that the Army would give to a family physician. And your experience is up to that point. So you'd been a clinic commander with a wide range of responsibilities. You'd now been in an operational medicine role. How do you feel like those experiences prepared you to be a, to run a residency program? Well, I think the, um, the pieces of the, the knowledge of family medicine, you know, how, how do I write orders? How do I move through a differential to come to a diagnosis? What medications am I going to use? I really felt that uh, came from my experience while I was in training at Madigan. The parts that I think really helped me is really understanding more so what is what is it that I really bring to the Army as a physician? And I think I learned that in VSPOD and I learned that as well with the 7th Special Forces group of Hey, we don't, we don't need another person who can shoot or who can navigate or can, or can communicate. What we need is somebody who really knows their value from a health professional. And so bringing that and in, inculcating that into our training so that we weren't just treating, uh, or we weren't just training the residents to figure out how to come up with the right diagnosis. But it was then, how do you apply that diagnosis and treatment plan into a military setting? Uh, how does that diagnosis differ if you're talking to an infantryman or you're talking to a helicopter pilot? It might be the same diagnosis, but you need to come up with a different plan in order to tailor it to either one of those populations. 
In your bio, you say that you continuously aspire to be a student and a teacher. What was it like to be in a formal educational role for you? Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, my experience at Womack, uh, being that program director for five years, is really where that statement comes from, that having medical students, having interns and residents that you're working with every day they clearly help you recognize that you don't know it all. And to be honest with you, inside of the, the field of family medicine, if, if you are only comfortable when you know it all, you're probably going to struggle. But this concept of lifelong learning and that uh, others who may be junior to you uh, can very much be the catalyst for asking the right question for you then to have to reevaluate, okay, so why is it that I do this this way? And, you know, the questioning of that really is healthy in helping you to develop, well, am I just doing this because that's how somebody else told me to do it? Or is there good science and evidence-based outcomes that is guiding that th those decisions? So this concept of lifelong learning is really what I'm trying to get at with that statement. And that, that lifelong learning is triggered many times by those who are junior to you. And you have to be aware of that. So you were in this role for about five years. What would you say was the most challenging aspect of, of the role? And what would you say you enjoyed the most? Yeah, what I enjoyed the most clearly was um, at graduation, reflecting back to the first day that I met that new intern and to, and to be able to see tangibly the development that had taken place inside of three years and to know with confidence that the residents that we graduated were going to go to a unit and provide value to that unit. Uh, without question, that it wasn't they were going to go to that unit and then have to get retrained. To me, that was the most satisfying piece is being able to invest in people's lives, help them to be able to grasp their vision of where they wanted to go and to convey uh, the importance of family medicine to them. The other part, what, what was the most challenging part of that? I think probably two things. One was just trying to figure out how do you balance academic uh, rigor with clinical application and administrative efficiencies and trying to figure out how do you, how do you keep all three of those things balanced on the table at the same time? And then the second piece of uh, the hardest part was uh, how do you, how do you deal with people who, uh, for whatever reasons, are struggling or are failing? And how do you address that, either from a competence perspective or from a character perspective, because those failures would come in both of those areas. And, you know, how to, how to adjudicate decisions with regard to those failures and then chart out a pathway that, again, was um, compassionate, but yet still ensured discipline. I, I think those were some of the some of the challenges that I had. So you were, you were there, as I said, for about five years. That brought you up through about 2005. So at this point, you've passed those initial years that you had, you had talked about, you know, where you were trying to kind of hold open your options um, in terms of, of, of how much time you would actually spend in the Army. Um, you, at this point, clearly you had a number of experiences that could have easily translated into a, a successful and lucrative civilian career. What made you want to stay in the Army? And when did you decide that you wanted to stay? I think the decision to stay was multiple times. I don't know that I really locked myself into the mindset that I was going to make a career of the Army until I was probably out at the 16, 17 year mark. Each of those places prior to that uh, where I had a decision to either stay in or get out, I felt like I had the ability to be able to do that and 
my mindset really was as long as I continue to conti- continue to have these these challenging jobs that generate value that allow me to grow and develop and to continue to influence as long as those keep coming I from my perspective I would be foolish to not stay in to do those things really even though I talked about money being a big driver of why I got into the military at that point I had kind of really come to the realization that money isn't where happiness was generated from mm-hmm. that happiness really came from other areas with regards to relationship develop leader development personal development and uh, satisfying people's needs and so the army kept giving me incredible opportunities and it made my decision to want to stay in the military very very easy so you you left the position uh, at Womack in 2005, and you went back to a line job where you were the division surgeon for the 82nd Airborne, which is also at Fort Bragg. Uh, what made you want to go back to the line after after teaching? Well, I think I think that's some of just who I am and my personality style is that I I like to move back and forth between different things. I don't want to stay stagnant in one area or another. Uh, it, it probably is a little bit why I like family medicine as well because I, I love not knowing uh, what's going to come into the clinic next. So this was this was kind of the same thing. I think the other part of it, of uh, going over to the 82nd was this sense of really wanting to be able to make a difference for soldiers. And where where could I do that? And I couldn't think of a better place to do that than with the 82nd Airborne Division. They also uh, have a little bit of hua in them. Yes. Uh, the hua is probably that adventure or uh, a little bit of sense of wanting to get a little bit of an adrenaline uh, charge every once in a while. And uh, clearly that's a part of, of uh, what drove me to that decision as well. You know, So to go to a place where I was going to be able to jump out of airplanes again and to uh, feel the, the, the sense of motivation and pride that a unit has every morning uh, running uh, up and down uh, Arden Street, which is a famous street at Fort Bragg, of where all the soldiers are doing PT, physical training, uh, each morning. Uh, that, to me, it was, it was just fun to be a part of that kind of unit for a while. So how is how were your responsibilities as a division surgeon different um, in scale, scope, from your responsibilities when you were with the 7th seventh, seventh Special Forces? Yeah, it, it, those two units are very, very different. I, I talked about small unit, very dispersed operations. That's kind of how the special operators work. The division, very different. Uh, you know, there's right around 12,000 individuals in the division. It, you know, the concept is how do we how do we mass our forces? How do we mass our combat power? on an objective to seize it, typically coming through uh, airborne operations, and then how do you how do you take care of that? So it, it really was much more deliberate, uh, larger scale operations that I now needed to figure out how am I going to coordinate health support for that. Capacity now became a critical planning factor because I needed to be prepared to take care of tens uh, tens of people instead of individuals that I would take care of with the special operators. So in 2007, you deployed to Afghanistan to be the command surgeon for the Combined Joint Task Force 82 in Bagram, Afghanistan. Uh, what was the unit mission there, and what were your responsibilities as a command surgeon, and how were these different from your previous assignments with other line units? Yeah, the, uh, the the mission in Afghanistan uh, for the, the Combined Joint Task Force surgeon was to uh, coordinate and execute all of the health service support for the U.S. forces that were inside of Afghanistan at that point. And so Afghanistan is a pretty dispersed country with difficult moving from one location to another. And so 
really trying to figure out where do we need to have evacuation uh, hubs, where do we need to have level one medical facilities, level two, level three facilities, how do they mutually support each other, how do we array the medical footprint to be in line with what the operations are going to be as opposed to where do we just want to be, uh, where would we, mm-hmm. so not where would we be best to put this medical asset because of power, water, uh, land, whatever, but it's, no, we, we need to be in the best place to support the individuals. So from a planning perspective, that was a, a pretty big task. It, it was also different from the other assignments in that we had joint services. So we had Marines, we had Air Force, we had Navy that were a part of that. And each one of those services brings different experiences and different cultures to how they execute the mission, both from an operator perspective as well as from a health perspective. And so uh, wrapping them in was a key piece. Was this an opportunity for you to learn more about the other services and how they how they actually operate their uh, medical support? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, that 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 came to bear every day uh, trying to figure out okay, so how did how do we have to adjust the language slightly? How do we how do we need to tailor something so that it meets the needs of Air Force or Navy or Marines? The other the other piece that I would just say was a, a another large task of that Joint Task Force surgeon at the time was to work with the Minister of Public Health for Afghanistan and to try to figure out how do we synchronize our development plan that the Minister of Public Health had for his country, and how do we as U.S. military members, how do we facilitate that? Uh, Where is it that we provide training? Where is it that we might co-locate with an Afghan medical facility? Or how do we get medical equipment brought in in order to allow them to function? Even basic things like how do do we get stable power and uh, water that uh, sterilizer machines can run on so that they can do some of the basic things that the Afghan health system uh, needed to do as well. So really having a chance in that environment to work with a uh, an ally at that point, but somebody who came at health from a very, very different perspective being an Afghan member of the equivalent of the cabinet. What uh, what was different about their perspectives on health from the U.S. perspective? I think there were a few. One of those would be that we can't we can't afford to think about and array our health system to just take care of individuals, but we have to think about where are we going to prioritize our our health resources. And for some, that's going to mean that there's triage that takes place, and you may not be able to take care of everybody exactly the way you would like to. I think another significant difference was suddenly viewing health professionals as being targets inside of a a war-torn country, that the enemy clearly understood that if they could influence the health professionals that were serving a particular province or district, that they could then use that as leverage against that that portion of the society to, to gain an advantage. And so to think about why would a couple of people who are going out and trying to give polio vaccine to children, why would they be targeted very specifically from the enemy? And then how do you, so now what do you do? How do you protect them uh, as they're trying to execute their, uh, their duties? So you came back from uh, your deployment to Afghanistan and you were, you became the commander of Irwin Army Community Hospital at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, tell us a little bit about Irwin. Uh, how big was that? And, 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 uh, in terms of staff, number of providers, and who does the hospital support? Irwin Army Community Hospital is in central Kansas, near Manhattan, Kansas. It is a community hospital. It has 47 beds, 
There's about 1,100 staff members doing both inpatient, outpatient kinds of care. They are there at Fort Riley to take care of the 1st Infantry Division and the subordinate units uh, of that division. And then also to take care of a total of about 50,000 beneficiaries, of which some of those were retirees who chose to live in that part of the country and to get their care from from the hospital there. So that, that's I think that's kind of a, yeah. a rough estimate of what that hospital looks like. So this is essentially a CEO job from a civilian perspective. What was it like taking on the leadership of such a complex organization? I mean, you'd been a commander of an outpatient clinic. You had trained family medicine residents. You'd done a number of staff jobs as a in, a, in an operational environment. But now you have kind of the whole, you have an inpatient operation. You have um, other specialties. What was that like taking all the, take, taking responsibility for all that complexity? I think one of the pieces that started to grow in me, and then in a future job it really became apparent, is this concept of uh, as a as a senior leader of an organization that does a lot of different things, you have to gain a comfort with not knowing everything, and the the realization that when you walk into the conference room that you may not be the smartest person in the room and you clearly won't have all of the right information down to the level of detail that I had been very accustomed to prior to that. So as a family medicine guy, I knew a little bit about uh, surgery, but I didn't know the intricacies of how to run a surgical department with operating rooms, uh, post-op care, that kind of thing. So I needed I needed to figure out how am I going to develop my direct reports to a place where I could trust that they were giving me the information that I needed in order to make the decisions for the organization. I, I think that's one of the developmental pieces that I began to appreciate there. I think another piece, maybe not exactly where you wanted to go with your question, but hmm. uh, I'll go there anyway, is I Feel think free. as the CEO, one of your responsibilities is to develop and define and then communicate the vision of the organization. Sure. I think a lot of organizations are comfortable just kind of bobbing around in the big sea and, you know, wherever the tide or the wind blows them, that's okay. To me, the, that's, that's a responsibility of the senior leader, of the commander, is to say, hey, we're going to chart this pathway. This is what our vision is going to be. And specifically for Irwin Army Community Hospital, that vision included how are we going to wrap our arms around the community that we have here at Fort Riley and really take health outside of the four walls of the hospital and take it out into the community and really become partners uh, along with all of the other community players. And so that, that concept of uh, defining, uh, developing, defining, and communicating vision, I think, was uh, another piece that was important with that job. How did you go about developing your vision? So I mean that's a big that's a big question for uh, you you I think you're 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 hitting on a, a key point of, of senior leadership like that. What was your process? How did you go about d- determining this is the appropriate vision for Irwin? But I think it it comes with a fair amount of effort put into introspection of the organization, and so. For Irwin, I, I needed to find out from my uh, higher up, so the next level of command, command was in San Antonio at the time, what did my boss, who was also a doc, what did, what did he view, what did he see as the importance or the value that that hospital was bringing? My secondary boss was the installation commander, who was an infantryman. And understanding from his perspective what he wanted the hospital to bring to the community. And those two things, those two leaders that I just talked about 
were not necessarily synchronized. Uh, one was very much interested in health delivery. The other one was really interested in how do we how do we have the best community that we can have. So I think in in, in developing a vision, uh, those two pieces are important. But then I also think you have to understand the the staff members that are a part of the organization. What do you see as the oper- uh, operating environment in which we're in? Where do you see the threats? Where do you see the opportunities? And really charting those out. And then I think the and so that was that's not just uh, the seniors, but that's also going down to the worker level and uh, getting a sense for that. And then I think the last input into that vision is deliberately meeting with patients and generating from them what their ideas are for what your organization, what the value of the organization can bring to them uh, as patients who live in that community. So I think it's, it's bringing all of those concepts together and seeing where, where, do, those, where do those things uh, synchronize and mesh, where are their differences, and then making decisions about we're going to seize the opportunity to go here or we're going to have to uh, put this uh, as a lower priority. To me, that's, that's kind of the process that I went through. You left Fort Irwin and you went to Saudi Arabia to be the assistant program manager for health affairs with the office of the program manager at the Saudi Arabia National Guard. I, I want to give you a chance to talk about that for a second and maybe we'll kind of fast forward through you also, after that, you hit, you, you came back to Fort Bragg to be the uh, medical brigade commander. What were your experiences over those next couple of jobs that really prepared you to take on the role you're in today as the commander of Brook Army Medical Center? What would you say you gained from the, the jobs following Irwin that really prepared you for where you are today? The uh, job in Saudi Arabia was an advise and assist to uh, half of the military forces in, in Saudi Arabia, advising and assisting at the equivalent of their Surgeon General level, all the way down to the medic in the foxhole. Uh, I think two pieces that I came away from that experience with uh, was, first, how fortunate we are in the United States to have a system that not only values uh, hospitals and garrison care, but we take the same intensity and apply it to field medicine so that we can get just as good outcomes in the field as we do in a brick and mortar hospital facility. I think the second piece I took away from the Saudi Arabian experience was an appreciation for our non medical military leaders who unfortunately have learned by wars of this nation that without medics, we would be a much different army. The medics are who fuels the infantrymen to charge up the hill, knowing that the medics have their back. In Saudi Arabia, I saw a system where they have not, at that time, they had not been at war and the level and intensity of the non-medical leaders to provide resources, to provide time and energy to medical training was very different. And I came away with the realization of we are very fortunate in our country to have that non-medical leadership that drives uh, performance inside of medicine. Uh, I did also then have a chance after that to go to the 44th Medical Brigade This was a a brigade that had 42 different units assigned to the brigade. Uh, Those units were everything from a combat stress control unit, preventive medicine, vet detachment, dental detachment, combat support hospital, ground ambulance company, forward surgical team. So all kinds of different units spread out over four four different military installations uh, across the East Coast. What was it that I gained from that experience from a leadership perspective is this concept of you can't know everything about every kind of unit 
turned that in spades there. Because all of those units that are assigned to that medical brigade in which I was in charge of, I had never been assigned to one of them uh, in the course of my career. So knowing how it is that a fleet of ground ambulances needs to have their maintenance done inside of a motor pool, uh, where do you learn that as a doc? But I was responsible for making sure that that uh, took place to standard. Then I think the other piece was that I picked up there at the 44th was be prepared as a senior leader to have a very diverse mission set where you may have to focus one part of your organization to accomplish task A, all the while another part of your organization is focused on a completely different task and that you need to make sure that you have each of them ready to execute just at the right time. So that that multitasking from a leadership perspective of subordinate units, I think, was uh, another leadership tenant that I took away from that experience. And then you had, following 44th Medical, Medical Brigade, you spent some time at the Army Surgeon General's office as the Director of Health and Wellness. Then you were, uh, again, sent overseas to uh, South Korea to be the Command Surgeon for Combined Forces Command in, in Korea. Lessons learned from those or those experiences. I think up the, uh, in Washington, just the influence of the political system uh, on everything that happens in the Washington area is uh, was very eye opening for me, especially you know coming from a small town in rural Montana. Um, but to understand that business only gets done through a very complex system of checks and balances. And in in that kind of setting, a good idea doesn't necessarily just live on its own. If it, if it doesn't have deliberate support from every one of the checks and balances, any, any, any great initiative can get derailed very easily in, uh, in our political and our very deliberate processes that take place uh, in a in a setting like Washington D.C., but it was it was incredible for me as well to see uh, how many dedicated people there are uh, at the Pentagon at uh, at that level that are absolutely trying to do what's right for the soldier inside of our systems of checks and balances. Over in, over in Korea, uh, again, seeing and understanding a different culture and a different uh, lens by which uh, South Korea looks at North Korea. And uh, uh, even though it's 50, 60 years later, that tension and how that tension influences uh, society. But there, uh, I think one of the pieces to me was that even if you've been developing your foxhole for 60 years, every day you still need to look at it and figure out how does it need to be improved. Where are some places that maybe you've gotten a little bit complacent in uh, that you need to step it step it up and, uh, and ensure or assure that you've got the right plan in order to be able to meet the health service support needs uh, of that area? So following your tour in Korea, you took command of Brook Army Medical Center in April of 2016, which is where you are today. Before we talk about your role specifically, can you tell us a little bit about Brook Army Medical Center? What makes it unique? For the, for the military health system, Brook Army Medical Center is absolutely unique. It is, it is an order of magnitude different than everyone else. It's the Department of Defense's only level one trauma center. It has the only level one certified burn center. It's the only place in the DOD where bone marrow transplants are taking place. It has 600 residents and fellows, 900 medical students, 1,200 medical technicians that receive their training in 38 American College for Graduate Medical Education programs, 22 different allied health programs that uh, train our technologists and therapists. It is a 425-bed facility, 66 critical care beds that go along with that. It is a full-up tertiary care system that can compete from a perspective of 
scope as well as quality with any other major medical system uh, inside the United States. What's the difference between an Army community hospital, so Irwin, for example, and an Army medical center? What's kind of the, when we use those terms, what does it mean? Yeah, certainly the scope uh, is one of those things. So 47 beds, 425 beds. But I think the things that really define uh, a medical center are the graduate medical and graduate health education programs. Typically at um, community hospitals, we don't have uh, multiple programs for graduate uh, health education. I think another piece that would help define a uh, community hospital from a medical center is the num- number of specialists and subspecialists that you have assigned uh, to that organization. And so, you know, inside of Brook Army Medical Center, there's 35 primary and specialty care services, 32 different subspecialty clinics. At Irwin Army Community Hospital, that number was probably more in the range of about five or six. Sure. You've commanded a number of units. Talk a little bit about organizational transitions and what it's like to come into an organization as its senior leader. And what did you think about as you were coming in to, to Brook Army Medical Center in particular? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question, and some of it, uh, I think I have to talk about the culture and the dynamics that exist inside the military. So military members, to include our civilians, are very used to leaders that spend about two years leading and then they move on to a different organization. When I talk to some of the counter, my counterparts in the civilian world, they look at that and say, "How? why would you ever plan to do something that way? But we definitely, inside the military, have a culture that that's how we're going to operate, and we see that as an opportunity to bring in fresh ideas, new energy, uh, new approaches to uh, to an organization. So obviously all of that comes to a head when you think about transitions. On the... On the flip side of that, the military members, to include our civilian staff, because our civilian staff makes up about two-thirds of our organization, they also recognize the leaders are only going to be there for a couple of years, and so sometimes there's this uh, hesitancy to move forward with an initiative because you know somebody's going to leave in a couple of years and that initiative may go away. So there's, there's definitely that culture and that dynamic that have to be considered as a senior leader coming in. I think when I came into Brook Army Medical Center as a family physician coming into a tertiary care facility, that's kind of interesting. My approach really was to spend the first 30 days really using one word, two, actually probably two words the most, why and how. So how do we do that? Why is it that we do things that way? And really trying, uh, and it it wasn't necessarily easy in all settings, trying not to say, trying not to draw conclusions from that, but really just trying to garner that information from uh, hire, from the staff, from our patients, in in the same way that I talked about earlier. And then we had a strategic offsite associated with that transition in order to be able to say, okay, now taking leaders and adding patients to that strategic offsite, how do we look at our mission statement, our vision, and what do we see as our initiatives that we want to move forward with in this next two to five year period? Uh, so that's, that's, I think that's kind of how I approached yeah. uh, the transition. So you are the CEO, commander of the organization. Who is your senior staff, not by name necessarily, but kind of by position, and how do you work with them to manage the the operation of the organization? I think the staff of a military hospital in the last three years has really gone through an evolution to replicate what we see many times out on the civilian side. So I I don't think this is going to be real dissimilar from the civilian. There's a couple pieces that are different. And the first would be I have a command sergeant major. That command sergeant major is somebody who is is my most senior enlisted member. 
and is the person that I rely upon to be the eyes and the ears for not only enlisted member issues, but also to move in and around the organization and communicate the vision, as well as to assess application, and then to know when and where and how to intervene when there's interpersonal conflict or conflict with regards to uh, compliance with the vision. And so that senior enlisted member is uh, really an important part of the staff. Uh, I have a deputy commanding officer who runs the staff, but also fills in for me when I can't be here. I have a chief medical officer and a chief nursing officer who are really brought up out of the tactical tasks of accomplishing healthcare. And their role is really to look at a big picture, what are the dynamics in this organization from the medical side and from the nursing side. I then have deputy commanders. I'll just list them. Uh, there's a deputy commander for administration, for surgical services, for medical services, for inpatient services, for quality and safety, for patient support, and for health readiness. Those deputy commanders are really the ones who are charged with applying the command's direction and then getting that out to where it's actually going to be applied in the field. And so they're they're critical members of the of the executive staff to be able to accomplish the uh, tasks and they're really a lot aligned as you heard by function not necessarily by profession. So that I think that's where the evolution in in military leadership in the last few years has gone is We don't have docs in charge of docs, nurses in charge of nurses, administrators in charge of administrators. We now have functional leaders where the deputy commander for surgical services has administrators, nurses, and docs all reporting to them uh, from a perspective of how do they get their direction and, and their guidance. So the military is taking on this this um, uh, approach that's allowing as you were just saying, leadership by function rather than by specialty per se. So what do you say, what do you see as the advantage of having a physician as the hospital commander with respect to um, the fact that other hospitals are commanded by other uh, specialties um, and the army allows that? But what, what do you, what does a physician uniquely bring uh, as the, in, as the commander? Yeah, I, I would, I am not in a position to say that I think a doc makes a better commander than a nurse or an administrator or a physical therapist or whatever it would be. I really think that once you get to this level of being a commanding officer, you have to separate yourself from whatever that tribe was, so to speak, and really be able to have a, a broad perspective of the organization. Certainly, as a physician, I'm going to understand the, uh, and to be honest with you, probably have a little bit more street credibility with uh, the physicians. Uh, and I have to be careful about how I use that street cred, either with the physicians or when I'm with non-physicians who might view whatever I'm saying through a lens of, well, that's just a doc trying to take care of docs and make life better for them. So I think there's a lot of different dynamics that come into play with with a, with a doc being uh, present. But I, th- I think one of the key advantages, at least for me, is having the senior leader who is patient focused. That really the reason why we exist is not just to publish papers or to do research or complete scholarly activity or to do this number of uh, operative procedures. But at the end of the day, it's about how do we take somebody who has a health need and move them beyond that so that they can have a quality of life that's commensurate with their vision and their expectations for moving through life. I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions about leadership because I know you've got uh, to get uh, going. Um, How would you define your leadership philosophy? I think uh, my leadership philosophy is centered maybe around three terms. The first one I would use is empowerment. 
trying to take the leadership opportunity that I have and whatever power exists inside of that designation and dissipating that throughout the organization so that the people who are doing the the tasks and the activities feel empowered that if they see something that could be done safer with better outcomes, done more efficient, improves patient satisfaction or staff satisfaction, that they are empowered to make those suggestions, bring about those changes so that the organization can fundamentally improve itself based on the empowerment of, at the lowest level. I think the second uh, part of my philosophy would be about discipline. And I equate discipline and quality to be very similar to each other. Knowing that you can come to work and that the person to your left or your right is going to do exactly what they're supposed to do, which then allows you to concentrate on your area, to me is something that definitely keeps an organization moving in the right direction. And then the last piece of that philosophy would be leader development. And and I see leader development being down at the very junior levels as well as the senior levels of how do we know and understand what somebody's vision, goals, expectations are, and how do we set the stage for them to accomplish them? That might be an additional degree. It might be a new specialty. It might be developing a new hobby. Whatever, whatever that goal is, how do we set the conditions by which they can develop professionally and personally to be better people at the end of the day? So I, I think those are probably three words that describe my philosophy on, uh, on leadership. What would you say are the characteristics and behaviors of a good leader based on your experience? Yeah, from, from my perspective, clearly integrating uh, a servant attitude into everything that that leader does. That the reason that they're a leader is not because of some special skill that the leader has, but it's really a perspective of how that leader can enable service to take place. Uh, I think also characteristic of a good leader is being humble. It probably goes along with being a servant. But again, trying to ensure that everybody inside the organization understands that this is not about how, that we're all working to make the leader better, but that this is about a team effort and every member has a contribution to be made. The leader has a, a certain contribution and every worker has a, has a contribution to made, to be made. And then the, the last characteristic that I would just throw out there is this concept of your actions speak so much louder than your words that I want to demonstrate what my leadership is. I don't want to describe it. I want to demonstrate how we're going to be service oriented. I don't want to just describe it. And so, so to me, that's how I would reflect a little bit on characteristics of good leaders. You, in your philosophy, you seem to be thinking about uh, mentorship. What does a good mentor do? And how important is that to you? Yeah, I think uh, a mentor really creates a setting that allows an individual to be introspective and to become self-aware. And, and I think those are, those are key elements that sometimes we lose, especially as we get more senior. The mentor has the ability to be able to say, hey, did, did you know this is how you're being perceived? Or when you talk like that, it gives me this impression. To me, those are all those cues that you need to have, especially as a senior leader, to say, well, hang on, let me, let me, let me reconsider how I'm approaching this. I think those mentors also set the setting by which, through some of their previous experience, and knowledge that uh, they can give some guidance into ways, other things to consider as you're coming to a decision point. So the, the mentor piece, I think, you know, uh, is important. In my career, that mentorship has not come from one person. 
that has really come from a variety of different people that I have specifically chosen that will help me look at different aspects of my life. So one of those mentors is not associated at all with medicine. Another one of those mentors is a family physician who clearly can uh, communicate with me as a colleague. Another mentor is just a, a senior leader in the military who is a line officer who, again, sets that stage for me to know how it is that I'm thinking about things so that I can be self-reflective and introspective. Let me, let me close on this uh, last question. What advice would you give a young person who's thinking about taking on a uh, leadership role, a leadership role in healthcare? What should they think about? So whether that person is a provider or administrator, if they're looking into the future, they're in early careers, they're looking into the future and they, they're thinking, I, may, I, I think maybe I want to do this. What should they be thinking about so that they can be successful? It may seem way too simplified, but I, I would ask that person to reflect pretty deeply on what's your intent. What's your intent for wanting to be that leader? If that intent is, how do I just climb the ladder so I can uh, feel more important, I can be more important, I can do those kinds of things, uh, you know, that that's probably not going to be a good recipe for the kind of leadership that we need versus I want to be a leader because I want to be able to have a greater impact on those I serve with or on those I serve for. If, if that's where the intent is, I, I think those are the individuals that clearly need to be singled out and deliberately developed to become the next generation of leaders for us. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community. And we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.